Hey, good morning everybody, or good evening, or good afternoon, or whenever you're watching it online, it is great to have you with us. We really hope that whether you're sitting in your pyjamas or you're sitting at your table, that you will be loving being with us here for church today. We really pray that God is gonna bless you and help you, and uh, whatever Pastor Alan is gonna bring to us in a moment, I really pray that it'll come from heaven to your heart and that God will really bless you. So get your pen and paper ready, open up your Bibles and get ready for Pastor Alan. Okay, this morning I want to talk to you about understanding saving faith. And you will probably remember, if you've read any of the Gospels, that Jesus re replied to a conversation about a commandment, about which was the greatest commandment. And in Mark 12, 31, he said these words, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you might wonder, well, what is the difference between those four things? And very simply, we can look at it this way, that to love God, first of all, to love it with God with all our heart means to love God with all our, our moral and our spiritual life. And we'll come to that in a little bit moment. And then to love God with all our soul, the soul really is, it's you, it's your life, it's yourself. For example, in Peter it talks about eight souls being saved in the ark. It's the, it's the total of you, your life, you. And Jesus talked about, if, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and yet lose his own soul, his own life. And then the mind is our intellect, our thought life. We are to, to love God with all our thought life and our intellect. And then strength, it's about passion. That our loving God with our heart and our soul and our mind should not be half-hearted. It should be full on with passion and strength. That's how God wants us to love him. Just like that. And the difference between heart and soul in scripture is that the heart is, is the center of our physical and our spiritual life. In fact, in the King James Version of the Bible, uh, the word is rendered bowels. Bowels. It talks about putting on the bowels of compassion. And then, of course, uh, as the, the word kind of got a little bit better in meaning, we now have the word heart instead of bowels. But it's, you've, you've surely heard that expression about speaking from your gut. Yeah. The gut life. It's that deep inner you. Uh, and that's what the, the heart is all about. And then soul, that is what leaves your body at death. Um, it's the kind of, it's the you, it's the real you that, that has that ingredient. It's very interesting that the word brain is not found once in the Bible. Very interesting. Uh, and, and it's very clear in the Bible that God's dealings with people is always with the heart. 830 times it mentions heart in the Bible. And in the New Testament, the Greek word for heart, heart is cardia from which we get our word cardiac arrest. So the word is very clear there. And yet, obviously, although God's dealings is with the heart, it's not the pump. It's not the pump. It's like that there's something deeper than that about us. So it talks about the Lord searches the heart. It's that inner gut of each of our lives. In Psalm 139 and verse 23, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Not that God would look on the heart as like a physician, as a physical thing, but to know my innermost good, my innermost self. So that's just an introduction, but let me just say this. Make a note of this before I kind of go on. That doesn't mean your head is not important. <laughs> In fact, you probably find you can't live without it. Your head is pretty important. And so just take that in, in, in kind of back of your mind because there's so much to say about this subject today. So first of all, let's look at saving faith because four times in the Gospels it talks about your faith has saved you. Saving faith. So let's look at its source. The word believe is frequently used in the Gospels and by Jesus himself. He talks about believing, believe, believe, believe. And we speak about Christians as being believers. So what is a believer? You see, because becoming a believer is not the result of head calculations. 
it's, it's not a matter about how clever you are to work something out. If saving faith was a product of human reasoning and human intelligence, then the brainiest people on the planet and the most academic people on the planet would obviously be first in the queue about being Christians. But it doesn't work like that. Uh, if salvation was a brain issue, you imagine what church life would be. If every time we preach the gospel, we had to consider a person's IQ. Wow. You know, just imagine it, that people that perhaps had never passed an O-level or the 11 plus or passed any test at all, we would think it's a waste of time telling them about the gospel because they haven't got enough grey matter. They haven't got enough in their head. I'm so thankful to God that the gospel and becoming a believer has nothing to do with our personal academic qualifications or ability. That to me is a blessing. As so I brought my own amen today. Amen, Alan. That's a very good point. It really is a good point. The apostle Paul had a brilliant mind. You couldn't get much higher than him with academic and intellect and religious ability. And yet that did not make him a believer. Didn't give him saving faith. And in fact, it's interesting that the, that the word head is never once in the Bible linked with faith. Never once. Because faith and belief is a matter of the heart. The heart. Not your physical pump, but the heart. That, that, that part of you that actually is that kind of moral and spiritual part of your life, which actually is the source of everything, which is why the Bible says, above all else, guard your heart. But it's the wellspring of life. Paul's words in Romans make this so clear. Chapter 10 and verse 9 and 10. He says this. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, not God, not head, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart, not your head, that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. What an amazing, powerful, clear thing. That becoming a believer is all a matter of what's took place in your heart. Listen to these words. 2 Corinthians 4, again from the Apostle Paul. He says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. In other words, the only way a person can become a believer is by a divine miracle of God shining his light into our dark hearts. Psalm 14 verse 1 puts it like how it is with the, the kind of general heart of mankind. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. And yet when we come to Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, there was a woman there listening to Paul preach. And this is what it says. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the gospel. Yeah. That's an amazing thing. That the Lord opened, not her head, not kind of suddenly giving her a brain wave, but a heart wave where she believed, had the ability to believe the gospel. You need to know this morning that if you are confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, if you believe in with all your heart what we've been singing today, that he died on the cross, he was buried and rose again and he's coming back right now, if you believe that, you are a living, walking, talking miracle because God has saved and rescued you by a miracle of wonderful grace. The source of saving faith is not how clever you are, but how merciful God is and how good God is. People sometimes wonder, how can people today believe so strongly things that happened 2,000 years ago when they weren't even there? How can people believe like that? How can we? 
You know, there's many things about Christianity. and You may not yet be a believer here this morning. And if so, I want you to listen really, really carefully. But listen to me. There are many things about Christianity. There are many things in the Bible here that the head struggles to grasp. Struggles to grasp. I mean, try and get your head around the Trinity. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Try and get your head around how could the Father have a son without a mother. Try and get your head around some of the theological issues. There's lots of things in this book that I, I don't... I can't get my head around. One of them is this, that God loves me. I'm amazed at that. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the kind of people God loves. <laughs> truly, truly. I'm amazed how he lets some people keep breathing on this planet. I'm amazed. I'd kill them. Seriously. Seriously. I think, God, why can you let that person keep living when these wonderful people are dying? I can't get my head around that. Can't get my head around that. I can't get my head around why God heals some people and not other people. I don't, I don't understand it. I can't get my head around all the kind of, the, the, the kind, of fi, uh, kind of fine details of the second coming of Christ. I know the major rocks, but I can't, I can't weave it all together in a very simple way that my head takes in. And yet the amazing thing is, is that one in three of the world's population today do believe all that. Two billion people on the planet believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead. I can't get my head around the fact that when we bury people, we talk about ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and, and talk about the resurrection. I can't get my head around that, but you know what? I believe it with all my heart. That's a miracle. It's a miracle to believe what your head doesn't comprehend. It's amazing to me. This is so simple, but it's so good. <laughs> Romans 11:33. Paul sums up this tremendous kind of writing that he's been doing in the previous 11 chapters. And he says this, God's ways are beyond finding out. He said, I, 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 can't, I can't fathom it. And we have to accept the fact that the Bible puts it very clearly and says that his ways are higher than our ways. Which means that your head and my head will not get around what God does. But I want to say this to you this morning, if you're not yet a Christian. Don't resist receiving Jesus Christ as your saviour simply because of what your head can't grasp. Because the Bible calls that the hardening of your heart. People who decide to become Christians... Don't do it because their head suddenly gets it. They do it because their heart suddenly gets it. And you don't need to know a lot of things. All you need to know is this. God loves you. You don't deserve it. Christmas was about incarnate God becoming a man. To walk on this earth to give us the revelation of God's grace and mercy. And then finally to hang on a cross in agony and shame to bear the price that you and I should pay and to save us from eternal hell and to give us a position as becoming a child of God with a wonderful heavenly father. That is the wonder. All you have to do is, is believe. God, you love me. Jesus died for me. Come into my heart. Amen. And if you ever feel that inclination, by the way, it's a supernatural thing because the heart does not naturally feel like that. Because it's dark. And Wesley once put it this way. He, he was in a meeting listening to somebody preach. And he said, these were his wonderful words. Two and a half centuries ago. I felt my heart strangely warmed. Yeah. Wow. Uh-oh. Something's going on. Yeah. I don't get this, but my heart's believing it. Yeah. That's the miracle yeah. of saving yeah. grace. People who make a decision to become a Christian through their head often don't stay the course. Some people think, well, because the world is here, there must be something behind it. So therefore, my head says, it, there must be something behind it. And somehow the big band don't make much sense. So, for example, you imagine now if uh, in the mission to Mars, they suddenly found a house on, on, on Mars. You imagine that. And they would say, oh, it just evolved. 
people would think. Huh? They, that's what they say, would say. And yet, when they look at the whole heavens, they say that just evolved. But to me, it's like, it's like it's, so people say, well, it must be crazy. No, I, don't, I definitely, know, there must be a God because I don't, believe that, I don't believe that nonsense. So there must be a God. So therefore, I become a Christian. But you see, it don't work. People don't become a Christian by using their head. Because basically, devotion to Christ is not a head thing. It's a heart thing. You, 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 it doesn't work. It does not work. The reason why so many Christians, voted commas, are casual in praise and worship is because they love God with their heads and not their hearts. If you love somebody with your heart, there's nothing casual about that. There's nothing passionate about the heart and clinical about the head. And clinical Christians will never change the world. Have you ever spoken yourself to anybody and then afterwards you thought to yourself, I didn't really mean that. Because what you're doing, you spoke from here and not from here. Have you ever been listening to anyone speak to you and thought to yourself, they're not speaking from their heart. They don't mean this. Because it's easy to say something from their head. And in fact, Jesus pinpointed that in Matthew 15, 8, 8, And he said this, these people, they honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We all know what it's like then to experience ourselves when we've not been real and genuine and spoken from the heart, but from the head. And we've also heard other people similar speak like that. Can you imagine on the February the 14th every year, on Valentine's Day, can you imagine a Valentine's card, all the Valentine cards with the image changed on the front and instead of a heart, there's a skull. Imagine that. I love you with all my head. How would people respond to that? With all my head, I love you. It would be weird, wasn't it? Because we all know that that is not how the head is. It's love and devotion and passion is a heart thing. And I love this quote from Simon Ponsonby. He said, I have been around you religious folk who have had as much passion for Christ as wax dummies at Madame Tussauds in London. They approach their life with less passion than an orthopedic surgeon faced with a bunion. <laughs> I just think that's great. You know, God save us from church life and Christianity that's like that. If you really want to understand the wonder of saving faith, this is how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and note this, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Oh, this is amazing. In other words, people don't become Christians by working it out intellectually but by God's amazing grace opening their eyes of their heart. And by the way, if you had your heart open, your, the eyes of your heart opened, that's great, but don't leave them half open. I was walking my dog this morning and I thought about that and I thought, right, so I decided to walk with half open eyes <laughs> with my dog. And then I opened them fully. <sighs> It's amazing how much more I can see. Which is why Paul prays that the, uh, that you're, uh, in, in Ephesians 1 that our, the understanding of our heart and the eyes of our heart and the enlightenment will grow and grow and grow. Yeah. Because it's great when you first see, but when you start to see and open your eyes, you start to think, wow. That's why the Bible talks about beholding wonderful things out of his word. By seeing more. By opening your eyes more. So saving faith, it's source. That's the first thing. I'm thinking that's not the time, but then I'm not. It's, it's a countdown clock and it's given me five minutes left and I've only finished my first point. Okay, second thing. <laughs> saving faith. Secondly, it's transformation. Saving faith. I can't believe that clock. Say, it's wrong. 
It's saving faith, it's transformation. In other words, when this happens to you, this is the whole thing, you see. Some people become a Christian with their heads and there's little that changes. But when you have a miracle that takes place inside of you, transformation occurs because it's impossible to be saved without being transformed. So, for example, being born again is this experience. And being born again, actually, post being born again, is so different to pre-being born again. It's like coming out of darkness into light. What an experience that is. And let me say this, becoming a Christian is not about you and me adopting a faith. It's about God adopting us. Isn't that amazing? So that we were outside of his kingdom, but then when God opened our hearts and with our heart we believed, God says, now you're mine and I'm adopting you into my family. You are a daughter and a son of God. And, and you can't have that experience and life to carry on as it was before. It's impossible. Impossible. Years ago, we used to have in church life, anyone that ever kind of prayed a prayer for Christ to come into the heart, we had what we called decision cards. In other words, that you, people made a decision. But being saved is not about you making a decision. It's about God making a decision. And it's about God embracing you with his mercy and goodness and grace so that in the end you, you have this experience whereby you say, I believe. I receive. And Christ, as Les has already said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what happens when we have this transformation? Well, there's a number of things. The first thing is that our worldview changes. When your eyes are opened, you see the world differently. When your heart believes, it's a different place. You see it now for what it is. You were part of it, but somehow now it doesn't appeal to you anymore. Because you've got different aspirations, different desires, different longings. You know, scientists continually change their opinions on the origin of the universe. And... I was listening to one recently in, in my car on the radio. And it was just, I was so blessed because this, this scientist, who was not a Christian, he talked about the recent space mission. And he was saying, there's so much we don't know. So much we don't know. He says, these were his words, he says, all we can do really as scientists is to just to stand still and look and marvel at the celestial wonders. And I thought to myself, that's exactly what God intended. He says, the heavens heavens declare the glory of God. And here was a non-Christian actually confirming what the Bible says. Another one said, "We, we, we can find out some things, but we still don't understand time. Where time came from. And in my mind, I think, well, Genesis 1. God created day and night. Day. Yeah, I think it's so simple. And it's like when you, you suddenly understand things in a different way. I was listening to one just recently again who talked about the fact that this was an evolutionist. He says, I just wish we could remove from the textbooks that are in the schools today the pictures that we've all seen from the stages of man. So you get this little chimpanzee down here getting bigger and bigger, becoming a gorilla and then becoming a man. He says... It's been in our textbooks since 1965. I wish we could eradicate them all. He says, no, he's not a Christian. But he just says, it's so incorrect. And and the the, the, the kind of the world view of these people keeps changing and changing all all, all the time. And yet you know something. This This is so wonderful. Why do I believe? Why do I simply believe what it says there in Genesis chapter 1? Well, Hebrews 11 tells me the answer. It says, by faith, we understand That the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It's so easy. It's so simple. When your heart is opened, 
It's like, yeah, because it's not about getting your head round the wonders of creation. It's about understanding by faith. This is what happened because God reveals it to be so. I read Genesis with awe and wonder. I read the first, first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think I don't have to manipulate it. I don't have to create billions of years to make it work. I don't have to adopt some, some, some evolution or part evolution theories. It's like, and anyone that believes that, you know, even if from a Christian point of view, and I can't open all this up, but if you believe that somehow that, that we evolved and then became the image of God, then that's a very, very... So when, 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 at what point then in that circle did mankind become the image of God? My Bible says that mankind did not become through evolution the image of God but God made man in his image and listen to me this is so simple now this is so simple amen Alan this is a good point listen this is what it says Matthew Mark 10 6 this is what, these are the words of Jesus the way the truth and the life this is what Jesus said at the beginning of creation God made them male and female wow I mean isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So it's two, two great issues for us. Uh-huh. Where we came from and who we are. Yeah. Okay. Right. Where do we come from? In the beginning, Jesus said, God made. Yeah. In the beginning, God yeah. made. Right. Not halfway through billions of years. In the beginning, yeah. God made. Yeah. Solves the issue of gender too. Yes, Male and female. Yeah. Male. We are living in days of confusion. On gender. And this is not the time and place to open this all, especially when I'm on the red on the clock. This is not the time and place. But, but uh, I'll, I'm pitching in two weeks' time, so I'll, I'll carry this on in two weeks' time. I've got permission already. I'm on the diary, so I'm not just taking authority over my boss. Okay. <laughs> but t- this, is, this, is really, this is really important. Just to, I'm going to sow this seed today. This year, early this year, the BBC produced a sex education program for schools in Britain for the ages of 9 to 12. And in that video production, the children were taught that there were over 100 genders and that to be transgender made people happy. Now, you've got to think about some of these things. If there were over 100 genders, you'd have to have another chapter in Genesis to list them all. Because my Bible says male and female. We've had three children by the grace of God. And when I've read the news, your wife's had the baby. I've asked, what is it? Never once has has the doctor come back to me and said, well, actually, we don't know yet. We'll have to wait and find out which is what this world is speaking about right now. You've had a boy, you've had a girl. This is a very sensitive issue, but churches cannot be silent on this issue, especially when the world is saying so much on this issue. Let me say this again really clearly now. We have to be, and we have to have, and this is part, again, of a transformed life, genuine compassion as Christians. Our heart has to carry the compassion of Christ. But that does not mean to say we have to be silent on issues that are not in line with the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. We have to hold on to what the Bible teaches We have to present God's truth to a confused world. But we must be sensitive to the people who have been confused, whose lives are in all kinds of needy situations. We have to make sure that we teach truth with love, real love, not simply head stuff, but hearts, so that people know 
we are genuine and care about them. One thing we can't do is this. We cannot allow dangerous and confusing dogma not to be challenged. The reason? Because this generation, this is the first generation for 2,000 years that actually are being confused and failed, failed, failed by the culture and by governments and by people with a different agenda. And it's time for the church to bring light into the darkness. Because we have our worldview. Not from, when it comes down to the pandemic, Boris Johnson says, we follow the science. When it comes down to Christians, we don't follow the science. We follow the Bible, the word of God. The second thing about this transformation is that values change. Because values are based on beliefs. Values are, are, are based, whatever your belief is, that will be the steering wheel of your life. It's not your head that steers your life, it's your belief system, it's your values. See, people, I've discovered this, people don't give by what's in their head. They give by what's in their heart. We can talk on a Sunday morning about tithing and the head works that out 10%. But do they give according to what's in their head? No, people give according to what's in their heart. People don't die for what's in their head. They die for what's in their heart. People will die for what they're passionate about in their heart. That's why people throughout history have died for this, have been burnt at the stake, have been uh, tortured. That's why in Nero's time, Christians died with were fed to the lions, they would not recount, they would not go uh, uh, and deny Jesus Christ and his lordship because they, it was in their heart. They would die for what was in their heart. If you are a head Christian, you, you, you quickly recant to save your life. But not when you have a real belief. Your values are different. That's why the atheists, the atheists live today like this. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's a belief system. That's a belief system from atheism because this is all we've got. So basically enjoy it. Basically, we, we came down from a tree or out of a swamp anyway. So let's just make the most of this. And then, hey, presto, it's all over. And so they, they live like that. I can understand why people pay a fortune for face changes, for Botox, for, for new fresh hair. I can't afford it. But I, I, can, I, can, I can understand why. Because if this is all they've got, it follows their belief system. So I won't condemn them. If you've got a million pounds to spend on new lips, have them. That's okay. It's your belief system. It's all you've got, according to what you believe. But a believer, someone who's experienced saving grace, oh, we have a different belief system, so get to therefore we do differently. Because my Bible says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Wow. Man, Alan, that was a fantastic preach this morning. It's just, it's just absolutely true. Our belief system, that is why dying is never the worst thing for you. Dying without Christ is the worst thing that can happen to anybody. But for a Christian, for me to live is Christ. That's my value now. And to die, what if I die? I'm going to see him face to face. It's Christian values, not atheistic values, that have blessed this world so much. Do you know the statement that all men are created equal? From the American statement of independence. July the, July the 4th, that, isn't it? that's what this is today. Well, that was planned well, okay. <laughs> Do you know that statement that's there, that all men are created equal? That's not the statement of evolutionists. They believe it's the survival of the fittest. Darwin believed that black people were inferior to white people. That's atheistic, evolutionist dogma. So why did the Americans in their constitution put down 
all men are created equal. Because that statement comes exclusively from what is written in the book of Genesis. And these were Christian people who believed that man and woman were made in the image of God. That's how blessed our world gets when it, Christians are actually influencing society on the basis of saving faith. Okay, the rest is going to come two weeks' time. But let me just end with a, a final little kind of a challenge. Challenge. There might be somebody here today that's not yet a Christian. And you've thought, I just can't get this. I remember speaking once to a... No, I'm going to go on to something else. No, no. You're not yet a Christian. And you think, I can't, I can't get my head around this. Okay, let me see if you give a little picture. When the Titanic went down, the White Star Line offices around the world had queues of people outside to read on two notice boards. One was at Liverpool outside their offices there. And there were two boards outside the White Star Line offices. And on one board it said this, known to be lost. And on the other board it said, known to be saved. And as they found the names of people who had survived or drowned, the names were added to each board. You need to understand today that those two boards are a symbol, really, or an illustration of what's true about every single person breathing on this planet today. The Bible says very clearly that there are names written down of those who are saved. And on those other side of things, there are the names of those known to be lost. Your name and my name is on one of those boards. I'm so glad today that by the grace of God, my name is on the board that says, known to be saved. Yeah. I was once on the board, lost. But by a miracle of grace, I'm on the board, saved. Whoever you are, nothing you've ever done will ever stop God loving you. Nothing you've ever done will ever, in your head, God, you, your head might say to you, God doesn't love you because you've been this, you've done this, you've done this. Your head's lying to you. The truth says God loves you. And if you open up your heart to Jesus Christ today, and you do what Romans says, you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that Christ died and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And today you can change your name from the lost board to the saved board. And I pray that you'll do it. Because if you do, you'll be blessed right now and blessed for all eternity. May God bless you. Thank you. Hey church, this is what's happening this week here at Hope. Uh, we'd love you to be committed to life groups this week. It's going to be our last study of the year. We're going to be uh, finishing with your social soon and your life group pastor will have all that information. But commit to life groups this week. It's going to be great. Uh, also, can you sign up for Happy Holidays Prayer? Of course, it's coming really soon now. We're going to be running this great project. Uh, and we want you to help us to pray this into being. And uh, you can sign up for that using the address below. And of course, talking about prayer, we've got our, our weekly Zoom prayer meeting. And we would love for you to be involved with that. The details are on the screen. But uh, we'd love you to come and put your prayers alongside ours uh, and see what God can do through the power of collective prayer. Now, next Sunday, we've got a great time. We're going to have a dedication service. Uh, that's going to be at the 11 o'clock experience. And we would love for you to come and support those families uh, next week. Now, for a one week only, uh, All Stars is going to take place at the 9 a.m. and the 11 a.m. experience. So uh, you've got uh, an opportunity to bring your kids to either one of those. And that will really help us with the capacity of people that we're expecting next week. Now, for everything else that you need to know, keep watching.
Life moves fast, doesn't it? Every day there is so much to fit in. But do you ever stop and think? What's the point of it all? Do you ever ask yourself, is there more to life than this? Alpha is a series of sessions exploring life, faith and meaning. It's a space to explore the big questions, to say what you think and hear other people's points of view. First up, there's food, then a talk, followed by a discussion. Each talk explores a different aspect of the Christian faith. And then in the small group, you get to say exactly what you think. The aim of the talk is to spark conversation, each week unpacking a different question. There's no obligation to say anything, and there's nothing you can't say. Seriously. It's an opportunity to hear from others and contribute your own perspective in an honest, friendly and open environment. Why not try it out?